Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your neurons. I'm Ian Wolf. On this edition, part one of my conversation with Rodrigo Kian Quiroga about memory. But first up, here's news of ice cream drones and electric shocks. <laughs> Ice cream that doesn't melt. A Japanese scientist has invented ice cream that melts very slowly due to polyphenols extracted from strawberries. The ice cream made in the lab didn't melt for three hours at 40 degrees Celsius. But the ice cream sold to the public only keeps from melting for an hour. Enough time to eat the ice cream, but with a lesser amount of strawberry polyphenols to keep it closer to the texture of plain ice cream. Walmart in the USA sells ice cream bars that are slow to melt using larger than normal amounts of gua gum for an anti-melting effect. However, gua gum in large amounts can cause diarrhea. So what are the side effects of the Japanese strawberry polyphenols? It turns out that strawberry polyphenols are very good for your health and are also sold in health food shops in pills. There are scientific papers showing that strawberry polyphenols can help you lose weight, that they help insulin sensitivity in people suffering diabetes, they act against inflammation, they're good for allergy prevention, and they help your body fight cancer, neurodegenerative, and heart diseases. Polyphenols are also a prebiotic that promote good bacteria in your gut. As antioxidants, they can slow one of the causes of ageing. Strawberry polyphenols have also been shown to protect against stomach damage caused by alcohol. Takeshi Toyoda, president of the Biotherapy Development Research Center in Kanazawa, Japan, was trying to find a use for strawberries that weren't good enough for the supermarket to help farmers from the Miyagi Prefecture, which is still recovering from the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. When trying to make a new strawberry confection, a pastry chef at the centre found by accident that the strawberry extract solidified cream. Tomohisa Ota, Professor Emeritus of Pharmacy at Kanazawa University, used that observation to create ice cream that melts very slowly. He's recently extended the recipe to include soft serve ice cream that doesn't melt for hours and can even be set on fire for a creme brulee flavour. The strawberry polyphenols slow down melting by suppressing the separation of the water and oil in the ice cream. Now, the main use for ice cream that resists melting is to stop you from getting messy clothes and a messy face, as well as making ice creams more easy to transport for businesses. However, don't milk products left unrefrigerated go off fairly quickly? As it happens, strawberry polyphenols also act as a preservative. And as if all of that isn't good enough, the strawberry polyphenol extract also slows down the formation of ice crystals, making the ice cream smoother and extending its shelf life. They've called the ice cream Kanazawa Ice, after the city where the laboratory is located. Little Ripper rescues swimmers. A lifeguard supervisor used a new drone to rescue two swimmers in trouble in waters off a beach in Lennox Head, on the far north coast of New South Wales. The Little Ripper drone had just been unveiled that day and was being demonstrated by lifeguard supervisor Jay Sheridan. Two men were swimming in powerful surf conditions about a kilometre north of the patrolled area of the beach when a member of the public noticed they were having difficulty in the three metre swell. Jay immediately piloted the Little Ripper drone over the men and dropped a self-inflating rescue pod within minutes. 
much faster than any surf life-saving guards could reach them. The two men were able to grab the rescue pod and swim back to shore unhurt. The drone also has software developed at the University of Technology Sydney to automatically identify sharks and alert the pilot. In the future, UTS may release a version of the software for the Little Ripper which will alert lifeguards to the presence of swimmers in distress. The Little Ripper was developed with funding from the New South Wales State Government. Shocking work conditions. The New South Wales Government has decided to put its trust in technology to replace regulation. The number of truck accidents on Australian roads has gone up over 40% since the Liberal National Party Federal Government abolished the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal in 2016. That was the body that had regulated the safety and pay of truck drivers. Truck drivers are under huge pressure from their employers to deliver goods faster than is safe, often being asked to give up rest breaks and to work extra long shifts, carrying heavy loads beyond the capacity of their trucks for very little pay. The Liberal National Party New South Wales State Government Minister for Roads, Melinda Pavey, has decided to blame the drivers instead of the now unregulated employers. On ABC Radio News, she's called for a technological solution. For truck drivers to be forced to wear a collar or bracelet or even a special seat cushion that jabs them unexpectedly with an electric shock if their attention wavers. Drivers would have no choice in the matter. The state government has rejected a call by the Transport Workers Union to re-establish a national road safety watchdog. Michelle Brown reports there's been a 45% jump in truck-related fatalities in the state between 2016 and last year. The Transport Workers Union has linked the increase to the abolition of the National Road Safety Watchdog in 2016. New South Wales Roads Minister Melinda Pavey says the trend has more to do with increased activity and that technology will be key to stopping further deaths and injury. The technology now is so advanced, a driver can be driving and get an electric shock if they look away from the windscreen for more than two seconds. Ms Pavey has asked the New South Wales Stay Safe Committee to examine recent truck crashes. A surprise electric shock delivered to tired and stressed out truck drivers on busy roads. What could possibly go wrong? You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Remember? Professor Rodrigo Kian Queroga is the director of the Centre for Systems Neuroscience and the head of bioengineering and holds a research chair at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom. He has studied for decades the neurology of memory, and famously discovered the Jennifer Aniston neuron. I spoke to him in Leicester by Skype from Sydney. I began by asking him, what is memory? How does memory work? Well, that's, I mean, it's a very broad question, no? I mean, so many different aspects. I think what I try to convey in my book is what I believe is I mean, the, the most important lesson I learned in these, I mean, many years that I have been studying the brain. And for me, the most important lesson is the fact that we remember very little. And this feeling we have of remembering our past experiences as if we are playing back a movie is to a large extent a construction by the brain. I mean, we remember very little facts and we fill in the rest based on assumptions we make, reasonable assumptions. We do remember some things. Yeah, of course, we do remember some things, but we forget most of them. And the point is, I mean, it's, the discussion gets, gets very deep because I think the fact that we forget so much is, I mean, a unique trait of what makes us human. And the reason is, I think we forget much because we use our brain machinery to understand rather than to remember. If we will remember everything literally, maybe we won't have enough processing power 
to get the meaning of this data we are we are receiving. So the point is we we extract very little facts. I mean, and we focus on these very little facts or events, and we process them massively, parallelly, redundantly, so that we can understand what this means. So we get the gist and forget the details, and only recall the meaning. Exactly, and I think that's that's the key. I mean, the fact that we do that makes us understand things. And that's why I think that's, that's, that's the key aspect of brain function. I mean, we are a forgetting machine. We tend to forget most things because we try to understand. Can we improve our memories? Yeah, I, I call this, I mean, in a previous book called Borges and Memory, I call, I mean, I have a chapter where I call this delicate balance between remembering and forgetting. We don't want to remember too much because then we are not able to understand. I mean, if we, if we read a book, and we can repeat it by heart. And, well, we won't understand much the meaning of the book. I mean, we are committed too much resources on memorizing words rather than, than, rather than at, at getting the meaning. But on the other hand, we don't want to remember too little. I mean, we don't want to end up like patients with Alzheimer's or people with uh, medial temporal lobe amnesia that, that cannot form new memories. So there's a balance. There's a trade-off. And I think millions of years of evolution makes us humans and make us rich like the sweet point that we remember what is enough for us to make this construction which our thoughts are based on. Research shows that students who take notes with a pen and paper do better in exams because they're forced to choose which things to record as opposed to students who transcribe every single word on a laptop. Exactly. I mean, if you get word for word, I mean... At some point, you have to make this digestion of information. I mean, because word for word will bring us, I mean, we bring you nowhere. I mean, you won't understand the, the content of the lecture if you just transcribe it word by word. So maybe you can do that because you can say, well, later on, I can read it again and maybe, but at some point you have to do a summary of it. You have to write what the points are. You have to, I mean, go to the meaning of it. So the point is that if you are taking notes, I mean, with pencil and paper, well, you're already doing this in the first instance. I mean, you're already extracting or you're already deciding what is the important information that you want to remember and how you put it within the context of the other information that you are already getting from this lecture. There are some talented people who remember better than most of us. Perhaps it's because they're thinking over the concepts more? Well, that's debatable. So there are many cases. I don't want to say that all the cases are the, like the ones I will tell you now, but I mean, we, we can go, I mean, in steps. So for example, there's a very famous case in the, I mean, in the early 20th century called Solomon Shereshevsky that was studied by a Russian physiologist called, a physiologist, a psychiatrist called Alexander Luria. And Luria realized that this guy had kind of like an unlimited memory. I mean, he couldn't find the limit of the memory of this guy. He was, I mean, he will remember everything. He was incredible. But what Luria described also is that as good as this guy was at remembering, he was equally bad at understanding things. So, and the way Luria put it in his book describing this case was that this, this guy was quite inept at any logical organization. He couldn't really go to high level thinking because he was stuck into details. Now, you also have cases described in the literature of people uh, that are called savants, and there are many of these. I mean, they tend to be autistic, and there are many of these that they will remember an awful lot. I mean, they will remember nearly everything. A famous guy, I mean, a famous case was somebody called Kim Peek, and actually the movie Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman was based on his case. And this guy had the same problem. I mean, as Shereshevsky, I mean, he could recite a book by heart, but he couldn't really understand the book. He couldn't tell you the meaning of, of the book. And I think it's a discussion that goes deeper. I'm not saying that people that remember too much will, I mean, will have a, a problem in understanding, but at school, I mean, at least at my school, I mean, when, when, when I was a high school student, I mean, we were kind of forced to memorize things. I mean, you, you learn things by heart, you repeat them in an exam, and then like next week you will forget them. And I think that's contraproductive, no? Because this is kind of like focusing on what really won't stay, because we know that memories like that won't last much, typically. 
And rather than focusing on understanding, and understanding is completely different from remembering. Do memory systems get in the way of understanding? Well, that's also a reason. No, I mean, I, I surprised myself that, for example, I can tell you, as it was saying by this guy in this paper in 1979, page, I mean, page 20 in the left hand side. I mean, and, and it's like, well, how can I remember this thing? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm also having a problem myself. But but the reason is because I'm working with this every day. So it's I mean it's it's my everyday bread. So I, I read these papers, I keep on looking at these papers. So after so many repetitions, I mean they somehow sticked in, in, in into my brain. So that that's not the problem. That's that's fine. But for me the problem is, for example, if you get a high school kid that is doing bad at exams, so then maybe the parents will send this guy to do some mnemotechnic courses so then the guy will go the kid will go and learn memory techniques for remembering better the names of things or the dates or how to put the name together with the date and and they work i mean they're fine the problem is this kid i mean will be kind of like having a trick to repeat things by heart but he will still be lacking what is the most important thing from education which is understanding and understanding is the opposite well not the opposite but it's not the same as remembering because sometimes to understand thing, as we said at the beginning, you have to forget. I mean, you really have to get the meaning of something, not repeat the names of every, I mean, of every important person or, or an exact day, but you really have to get the, the point. I mean, you really have to understand what happened and put it into context. And I think for me that's, that's more important and that involves forgetting some less relevant facts. Does all this forgetting mean we have more room to remember our experiences? Well, surprisingly, we don't have much, that, that much room, no? I mean, because we know there are areas that are specific for memory and that have specific memory functions. And you don't have an infinite number of neurons in these areas. I mean, it's relatively limited. So I don't want to get too technical, but for example, there's an area that we know that is crucial for forming memories, which is called the hippocampus. And within the hippocampus, there's a sub area that is the key one, which is called CA3. Doesn't matter the name. I mean, it's it's just a name that people gave to this area. But the important fact is that in humans in this area, we have only 2 million neurons. And that's not that much. I mean, 2 million sounds like a big number, but if you want to start storing many memories, I mean, well, then this number is not that large. So yeah, we do have many neurons, but the machinery for remembering is, is not, I mean, it's not that big. And as I say, I mean, also, we don't use the memory, we use it for understanding. Are there individual neurons that light up when we recall individual concepts or people? Yeah, yeah. So these are some neurons that I discovered with, with some colleagues about 10, 15 years ago. And we found these neurons because we do recordings in, in patients that they are implanted with intracranial electrodes inside the brain for clinical reasons, because they're trying to cure them from epilepsy and they try to understand where the seizures come from. And for this reason, they put electrodes inside the brain to try to see where the seizures come from. But this gives us the amazing opportunity of recording neurons in the brain of, of human subjects. In, in, this, in these patients, I found different type of neurons that fire to different people. Like the most famous one is actually the first one I found like this, fire to Jennifer Aniston. So I will show whatever picture of Jennifer Aniston and the neuron will fire. And I will show something else and the neuron will not fire. And in some other cases, I found that the neurons responded even to the name of the person and not to other names. And so this means that the neurons are firing to the concept, not to the details of one picture or the other. I mean, it doesn't fire to the nose of Jennifer Aniston or the, how the hair looks like or what she's wearing. I mean, it fires to her. So. And that's already a mechanism of, of forgetting because the neuron is not caring about details. So details are gone. I mean, for the neuron, it doesn't matter if Jennifer Aniston is from front view, from profile, wearing a red dress or with, with, with her hair like this or like that. I mean, for the neuron, it's Jennifer Aniston or Halle Berry or, I don't know, the Sydney Opera House. I have another neuron that fired to the Sydney Opera House. So it is the Sydney Opera House. doesn't matter how it looked like on this particular day. And that's already a mechanism of abstraction, of forgetting details. And that's exactly the conceptual representation we use for our thinking. And that, I, I think for me, that, that makes everything full circle because these neurons are showing 
a, a high level of forgetting of details of abstraction, and they are the base of our memories on, and, on, and of our thoughts. Do these neurons in the hippocampus store more than one concept? No, it's not one concept per neuron, no. Uh, it can be more because these neurons will also show that they do encode associations. And that makes a lot of sense. And that goes back to Aristotle. I mean, Aristotle, like 2,500 years ago, argued that associations is the key component for, for memory. So since ancient times, we know the importance of associations for memory. And I put you a simple example. If, I mean, maybe, I mean, you, I mean, you went last, last, Last week you went with a friend, I mean, to, to watch, I mean, or to have a beer. So, and you will remember this event, but the core of this event is actually an association, it's an association between concepts, because you would associate the concept of your friend with the concept of the rest of the pub you have been in. So you remember, oh yeah, yeah I mean, I remember meeting this guy in this place. And you may remember a few more things that you may associate to these two concepts. So basically, what I will argue is that the core of, of a memory of our experiences is based on few associations. I remember meeting this person in this place and maybe doing that thing. So three or four concepts. And so then what we found is that these neurons that they represent concepts, sometimes they do not represent just one concept, they represent more than one, but these concepts are associated. So they encode associations between concepts as well. So they, they do respond to more than one concept. That was part one of Professor Kian Kiroga talking about memory. Please remember to tune in next week to hear part two. And finally, the 24-7 challenge. At the 2017 Ig Nobel Prizes Ceremony, the Annals of Improbable Research not only gave out prizes for science that first makes you laugh and then makes you think, they also hosted the 24-7 challenge. He is Master of Ceremonies, Mark Abrams. Now get set for something special, the 24-7 lectures. We've invited several of the world's top thinkers to tell us very briefly what they're thinking about. Each 24-7 lecturer will explain her or his subject twice. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. And then, after a brief pause, a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. Our referee, Mr. John Barrett, has joined us. Uh, he will enforce the 24 second time limit. Mr. Barrett. Um, microphone. Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, do you have any advice for our 24 seven lecturers? Gentlemen, keep it clean. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. <laughs> the first 24-7 lecture will be delivered by a professor of artificial intelligence and the philosophy of technology at Kosminski University in Poland. Please welcome Alexandra Pregolinska. Her, her topic, bots. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 Seconds. On your mark, get set, go. We presented a study of human body interaction based on an experiment that consisted of two parts. Measurement of psychophysiological reaction to chatbot users and the questionnaire that focused on assessing willingness to talk to a robot or chatbot. Our particular focus was on the Uncanny Valley effect. And in the experiment, we juxtaposed the EDA channel with the digital input channel and the data indicated a very strong positive correlation between the Uncanny Valley effect and the negative affect evaluation. And now, <laughs> and now a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. Robots that talk are perceived as stupid. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Record a voice memo on your phone or use the voicemail tab on the website. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations 
to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. Join my patrons in supporting the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incomatech.com. Sound check and fact checking by Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia, to 27 stations on the Community Radio Network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambaka Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Please subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusion radio. If I can get up to a thousand subscribers, we could actually get a few cents from YouTube. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.